All right, let's talk about the last ice age. We had in North America a glacier that came down from Canada, and it, you know, a glacier of course forms when snow falls, and then the snow, the weight of the snow kind of squeezes the snow into ice, and then it squeezes the ice a field as it gets bigger and bigger. It pushes Earth, and so what's happening is in the last ice age, Earth material rock from the Adirondacks around here kind of got pushed with this, what is called the Wisconsin Glacier. And it got pushed and it stopped right here. And you'll notice that's right around New York City. And it pushed all of the loose boulders and that kind of thing to the edge of the glacier in two ways. One is when the glacier first formed, it pushed all this rock down forward with it on the, on the advancing edge of the glacier. It pushed the rock, kind of heaved the rock forward. And then secondly, as the glacier continued, there was always melting down by New York City, but then there was always more snowfall in Alberta. And so as the southernmost glacier melts, the northernmost glacier advances to the south. And as it does so, it erodes the rock and is continually dropping rock at the edge. And the edge of that glacier, you'll see, is kind of parallel to uh, Long Island. So that's kind of how we got Long Island. The glacier pushed down, uh, and then you see it right in here. You see Long Island, and as the glacier advanced, it deposited all that. Now, in Long Island, the bedrock is actually quite deep. Long Island would be underwater if it weren't for all of this rubble and loose earth matter that the glacier pushed down. But Manhattan's a bit different. Manhattan is, well, you're probably somewhat familiar with Manhattan. You see these two areas of larger buildings, one down here downtown and one up here in Midtown. So these are where the skyscrapers exist. And then in, bet in between, we have low-rise buildings. And the popular origin myth for these large buildings, and it may or may not be true, is that there's really shallow bedrock right in here and in here, and really deep bedrock in here. And that's actually true, kind of. <laughs> there is extremely shallow bedrock right in here in Midtown. And then it dips, the bedrock dips down, it's called the Manhattan Schist. And min, the Manhattan Schist bedrock dips down to be quite deep in the middle. And then it comes up again downtown. And so if you're going to build a building, and it's going to be a very tall building, you need a stable bedrock foundation to rest your building on. So if you don't have to dig down too deep, all the better, all the less expensive. So you see the two areas of the, of the largest buildings here and here, another view. Here again is Midtown. And if we took Manhattan and we look at it from above, and then we were to kind of go and look at it in section, we would see the bedrock from the north up here. Uh, it's quite shallow. And so here's uh, Central Park South, 42nd Street, 14th Street, Canal Street, City Hall. And as we move farther south, you see the bedrock dips way down and then comes back up. Now, generally, the biggest buildings are here in the shallow bedrock, but also here. So it puts some question to the origin myth because while this area of Manhattan has shallow bedrock and so does this area, this area right here has some pretty big buildings and pretty deep bedrock. So there are some economists now that are casting doubt on that theory and saying, well, maybe it just big buildings happen to come about based on other economic factors. We'll let the economists hash that out. Next question. Which of the following statements is more often true? The first statement is, we want buildings to settle the same everywhere. The second statement is, we want buildings to settle more in some parts than others, depending on the weight of the building, the number of floors, the type of structural system, and the type of soil the building is bearing on. Go ahead and hit pause and determine which of those is more true. Of course, we want buildings to settle the same everywhere. The other option is to have differential settling, and we don't want differential settling. Differential settling means that walls crack. Differential settling means that doors don't open and floors get slopey and windows crack. Generally, settling will happen. It's going to happen. We just prefer it that it's not too much and that we do prefer that if the building is going to settle, it settles more or less uniformly. Now, if the building is sitting on a uh, rock, the settling is going to be negligible. But on other types of soils, it may be a little bit more significant.
Now, there are some extreme examples of differential settling or just extreme examples of settling. This is the Chicago Auditorium, and if you've heard some of my other videos, I also talk about this in the context of uh, lighting and then later acoustics, but it settled 29 inches in some places, and it was built on 100 feet of soft clay. Now, when it was built, some of the deeper foundation techniques like caissons and deep piers had not really been invented yet. And at the time, it was the largest building in the U.S., by far the tallest building in Chicago. And because we didn't have these deep foundations available to us yet, we hadn't, we hadn't come up with those yet, we built the entire building on what's called a raft foundation. So we crisscrossed railroad ties, and then on top of that, we put two layers of steel rails, and we embedded the whole thing in concrete. And frankly, the design may have been okay, except originally it was designed for a lightweight terracotta facade. After the construction of the foundation, however, the facade was replaced by a much heavier masonry facade, and the much heavier masonry facade started to cause the building to sag. And so the walls became heavier around the perimeter relative to the center, which was more lightweight, and we started to have differential settlement. And we had it pretty soon after construction, in the first decade after construction. Now, if the entire foundation was not acceptable to hold up a building like this, it would be catastrophic, but that's pretty rare. Generally, what we're designing for is even settlement, but we're okay with a little settlement. Generally, the earth doesn't totally fail us. So while that would be more catastrophic, the more common problem is differential settlement. And so you see in the, if you go into the lobby of the Chicago Auditorium Theater, you see it's all kind of cattywampus and warped because the perimeter has dropped relative to the uh, interior. Even more dramatic, perhaps, is the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City. Just like in Chicago, it's on some clay soil. And just like in Chicago, it's sunk, in this case, not 29 inches, but 15 feet and counting. And Mexico City actually has hundreds of buildings in the city are sinking because the city's thirsty and it's drawing water from the city's aquifers at a rate faster than the rains replace the water. And as the aquifer lowers, the ground above it lowers also, but not totally uniformly as you might imagine. If we have kind of a slopey, slopey floor, like in this restaurant, that's off by more than one degree, that's really the threshold where people start feeling weird and vertigo. So um, this is where I took my wife on Mother's Day and I noticed the floor was out of whack. I'm not sure if it totally shows up on the photo, but you're going to have to trust me on this. It's an older building, and the floor was out of whack. And it felt really weird, actually, to be up there at that restaurant, on the second floor of that restaurant. Back to Mexico City, parts of the city have sunk as much as 27 feet so far. So this building sunk 15 feet, but parts of the city have sunk as much as 27 feet, which is about two and a half inches a year. Since 2006, about 50 structures have been condemned because of this, and there are 5,000 more structures that are at risk. Now, the most famous wacky foundation or differential settling, of course, is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Again, same thing, constructed on soft ground made with silt and clay and shells and sand. It had an inadequate foundation right from the beginning. The bell tower, it's a bell tower. It was, it was uh, constructed in the 1100s and finally finished in the 1300s with a couple of long pauses in between. At its most leaning, it leaned by as much as five and a half degrees. Now, we've been doing several different remediation measures over the years to mixed success, and we have it back to four degrees, which we think we can kind of keep it there now. But we had all kinds of techniques. We have come up with all kinds of techniques to try to stabilize or even right the tower. We've tried to use counterweighting on the backside so that we could straighten it up. We tried wrapping plastic coated steel up the tower. We tried pouring a concrete ring around the base. We tried removing some of the soil from one side. And like I said, some of these have worked and some of them have not, but I think uh, we, the, the experts generally think that we have it.